What would make a 14 year old boy who has been 24 seven bed dependent seem to have a weaker voice now, even than even six months ago? Who wants to start? What's his, what's his subtitle? Nemo, does that make a difference? Certainly. Okay. So, first of all, I, I'm Lauren Cooper. I'm a pediatric cardiologist in Children's Hospital of Colorado in Denver. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I also want to thank the organizers for inviting all of us and uh, for leaving the most important topic to the exact middle of the conference uh, to be kind of a, a climactic event. So just know that that's what's happening right now is the climax of the conference. Uh, so there are... Uh, and I, I promise not to attempt any more humor. Um, <laughs> there are a number of reasons that uh, voice can become weaker um, in, in neuromuscular disease. Um, and so I think it's worth being systematic about it. Not, I'm doing this off the top of my head. So uh, please, others, jump in. Um, but I, I would think from essentially top to bottom. So is there an upper airway obstruction? Is there vocal cord disease? Has the upper airway become um, more hypotonic or collapsible such that air coming from the lungs cannot east as easily as before pass through the vocal cords? Is there an issue with the tracheostomy stoma um, such that there's more leak coming out of the stoma itself, and therefore less air going up and through the vocal cords? Does the ventilator need to be adjusted because the chest wall is less compliant and therefore can't accept as much air with the same amount of pressure? Um, and is there an intercurrent illness or mucus obstruction that could be causing the, the voice to be weaker? So that, that's kind of the way I would think about it. Yeah, so um, I'm Amy Boo. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist from Stanford University. Um, I direct the pulmonary portion of the neuromuscular clinic, but I'm also an air digestive specialist. So um, voice and swallow is one of my specialties. So Oren got it correctly. Right, which is that <laughs> well, the voice comes from something called your voice box, which is in the um, between your lungs and your throat. And so you need airflow through this passageway to create your voice. And so I actually missed in the question if the patient is treated with a tracheostomy or non-invasive, but you need enough lung volume to um, create your voice. And then you also need to coordinate the way you speak um, and breathe. So naturally we're supposed to um, talk during ex uh, during exhalation but sometimes if you're breathing fast or breathing um, insufficiently that can get discoordinated so sometimes you have to relearn how to speak actually and so partnering with your speech therapist or your occupational therapist can actually help with your speech quality in a person who's getting progressively weak over time dr kravitz do you have anything to add um, I think everyone's hit all the topics very well. I, I would be worried that if someone's getting weaker in the voice, that they may be starting to have swallowing dysfunction and we want to reassess their ability to swallow and make sure that's not a confounding feature. Excellent. All right. This is, I'm going to give this to Dr. Foley. How important is regular cough assist use? There are many things we need to do every day and we often skip this. So disclaimer, I'm not a pediatric pulmonologist. I'm Reagan Foley. I'm a pediatric neuromuscular specialist, but Rachel knows I spend 95% of my time talking about pulmonary and with the support of my colleagues. So I think we, we like to say the cough assist is the miracle worker, um, not to be forgotten, to be used daily as a form of exercise. We keep it often um, for the patient's tolerance and the inspiratory mode, kind of a maneuver. We can, you, you can use it multiple times a day in the morning, in the evening, but then during times of illness, of course, in the inspiratory and expiratory mode for expert, expectorating or bringing up phlegm and coughing. So and the question was. Do I have to do it every day? We have a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, I, I would say like a couple of our colleagues said in the college in six sessions, like brushing your teeth. So yes, like brushing your teeth. Yes. It should be every day. Yep. Yeah. Um, Skip something else. <laughs> so I'm uh, John Pasco. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist with a sleep background too at Cincinnati Children's. Um, and I was in college in six. And so with cough assist, it is, yeah, it's sort of one more thing. It takes time to do definitely. But, you know, after 
sleeping overnight and secretions can maybe not be as mobile and, and hanging out down in the lungs. First thing in the morning when you wake up, clearing out the lungs is a great thing to do, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing to think about with cough assist is it's also like a, a physical therapy maneuver. And so we've talked a lot about contractures, right? And so thinking about the rib and the spine as a joint and something that can also develop contracture and become less mobile over time. And so using the, the cough assist, which is a sort of proprietary term, so insufflation, exufflation, um, that insufflation portion of it, you take a, a big breath and you hold it it can really help to stretch uh, the chest wall too. So it's serving multiple purposes by, by doing it. Dr. Kravitz. Well, I mean, I, I agree. I like the analogy about uh, brushing your teeth, but I think in some ways it's more like flossing and we only do the flossing right before we go to the dentist. Um, I think in the ideal world, we would be doing it once or twice a day, both in insufflation and exufflation mode, in insufflation mode for uh, chest wall stretching, uh, ligature stretching and the like, and you know, for part of physical therapy. So in an ideal world, that would be, I would agree with that. Um, but we live in the real world and you're right, there are lots of different therapies. So um, sometimes we have to skip something here and then. The, one, the thing I would say about the cough assist is it should be used on a regular basis, but if you have to miss a treatment once in a while, it's okay. But it's ideal not to get into the habit of missing it five, seven, 10 days out of a couple of weeks, then you're going to get out. Plus you're going to get out of practice. And when you need to use it for an acute process, uh, we always want to make sure that the families and the uh, patient are comfortable. So it's not sudden surprise. So I agree with my colleagues. It should be ideally used in a daily basis, but we all understand that there are a lot of things going on. And the question is, how do we balance all these things? And I think each family and each patient is going to decide what is in their best interest on any given day. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next question. <clears throat> so we know in the congenital neuromuscular conditions, small mouth, jaw contractures is a real problem, right? So then when you're trying to do a PFT and you can't get your mouth around the blow device, what's the alternative? Is there an alternative? Yeah, I think that that is challenging. So um, what uh, the question is asking about is usually for spirometry, we use a mouthpiece that's round and big. So it's challenging for children who are small and challenging for children who have limited mouth opening. So um, I would, I, what is in development is to use um, full face um, interfaces to measure that covers the nose and the mouth. Um, unfortunately, that seems to be only available at um, research centers who are doing um, other maneuvers that require full face coverage. And so at my institution, we do do that. Do do that. Um, I am a proponent of advocating for our patients that we need smaller mouthpieces to fit our children, especially when standards of care state that we should be checking lung function down to five years of age. And these mouthpieces do not fit in, into our patients. So I, I empathize that that is an issue and that as a field, we do need to improve that and measuring lung function in uh, our younger patients, our patients who may not be able to follow instructions easily um, or don't want to follow instructions that day. Um, and I think that that is a gap in our field and that we do need to improve it. Um, in the meantime, though, I do think that lung functioning, lung function um, measures do help answer that question of what do I need to prioritize today? Or what do I need to prioritize in the next six months when other things are coming up in my life? as that last question alluded to of doing the cough assist every day. And in my muscle clinic, we routinely use full face mask for spirometry, uh, recognizing either bulbar weakness with a wide open mouth that has a difficulty closing, creating a seal around the uh, pneumatac tubing or limited mouth opening that uh, doesn't allow the tube to get in in the first place. So we do full face mask testing routinely. Okay, we're gonna go back to cough assist for a minute. How many breaths should we be doing cough assist? Richard, you wanna take this one first? We'll give you a first shot. Okay, <clears throat> it, it, it can really vary and a lot depends if it's for basic airway clearance or you have increased um, mucus that particular day. You know, I usually use five cycle, you know, five coughs and five cycles per session, uh, but it can be anywhere from three to five 
done three to five times per session. Um, it really depends on what's going on at that uh, moment. And also, are you adding in vibratory mode or not? Um, so it's variable. It's also what you're comfortable with. So as long as you're getting enough effectiveness, uh, that's the key thing. And, you know, but going too little with too low pressures is not going to be useful. So you want to make sure you're going to get maximal bang for your buck when you do it. So a couple of studies out of actually John's group in Cincinnati and uh, out of Philadelphia suggested that for chest stretch, you really don't need that much pressure, probably 15 to 20 water, centimeters of water pressure, where our cough assists are usually set at more than that, 25 to 40 usually. So to get chest stretch, you may need actually less pressure. So if you're using it for that PT kind of mode, less pressure may be helpful. And then uh, I will say in terms of coughing, none of us cough on an every four hour basis exactly five times. Uh, so if you're using it during illness, you should use it as much as you cough, uh, which can be an unscheduled event, right? You really, you truly, you can't overdose on it, right? So whatever it takes. Um, that said, if you're increasing it, we usually say, like we've talked about, right? Twice, one daily to twice a day when well, ideally if you can. And then when you're sick, probably at least four times a day and you could do it every hour, but that's definitely something where you for sure want to let your team know because then maybe that you need to be seen just to make sure everything's okay. Um, but it's not, it's not something you can really overdose on. As far as the pressures go, the way we, that study determined the pressure was actually measured the, lo the lung volume that was generated by a given pressure. And then it kept on increasing incrementally until you saw that the, the change in volume did not increase by uh, more than 10%, I think was our number. And so it really doesn't take much pressure to, to get that sort of maximal effect. And it's, I think more about potentially a little more about the inhalation, like the, the time the breath is delivered um, to really get the open up the airways and, and stretch them out. So, um, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go suction in a minute, speaking of breathing stuff. Um, can we talk about managing daytime chronic hyperventilation? So tidal volume is already maxed out um, using daytime BiPAP settings. Does the tracheostomy the answer? Shouldn't leave during this part right now. Um, should, can we resolve this with constant BiPAP? Discuss and I'll be back. <laughs> and heels away. Um, I, th I think that it's, it's a great question, sort of what there's different uh, modalities that one can use to. And the question of when is a, a uh, it's, it's the, the question of when to start that is also more just about sort of the symptoms that are there. It's not necessarily what number are you blowing in clinic, right? <clears throat> um, so while it definitely helps to see that perhaps the carbon dioxide level is a little bit higher, like more than 45, um, for sure that sort of sends some flags up for us. But um, I feel often before that happens, you're hearing patients say that I'm starting to fatigue later in the day and I've actually just put myself on BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation, I think is the, the way to really think about this um, and feel better with it. And so um, as you're sort of alluding to, there's the, that nasal mask interface that could be used continuously potentially, but mouthpiece ventilation can be um, a game changer really. And um, I think it's something that more is um, before wasn't as well known and I'm seeing more and more of it, thankfully. And I think we have a huge proponent here. I'm not sure that he's here right now perhaps, but at any rate, um, it's, it can be an alternative to tracheostomy. And I think one thing to consider is you have the mouthpiece that potentially one can either sort of hold and support, or there's some brackets that can have it sort of supported for you and have it right at your mouth. And when that's the case, it is within your line of vision potentially. And so that might become pretty annoying through the day. And so for some, they, they, you know, wouldn't want to hold the circuit and they wouldn't um, want to be taking breaths from that right in front. And so then you talk about tracheostomy uh, tube and you can still talk with a trach potentially. Right. And um, it's all sort of, I think, personal preference and, and sort of talking about the, the goals that one has to with it clearly to ventilate. Right. But in terms of other daytime function aspects, um, taking that into consideration, there's no right or wrong. Honestly, the right thing is doing what the patient uh, what makes the most sense from multiple standpoints. 
Yeah, so from an, as John was mentioning, there are objective measures where we say daytime support may be um, helpful to you, usually around a vital capacity of 30% predicted, or if your daytime CO2 is rising. That's nice for me to know. I'm not sure that our patients care what the vital capacity is. Like they, I, I don't know anybody that walks around knowing what their personal data is and acting on it just because it's a number. And, um, and so I, I usually ask my patients, well, if you're in a restaurant pre pandemic, if you're in a restaurant, can you be heard, right? If you want to get that second beer for the adults, please. Um, or, you know, if you want to change your order or whatever, you want to talk to your family in a restaurant, can you be heard? If you can't be heard, your voice is pretty soft and maybe you could use some support to, uh, to augment your voice in the form of non-invasive ventilation. And that can be either, again, nasal interface, mouthpiece, or invasive through a tracheostomy. Um, the other place I see it is in swallowing assistance. Um, so if someone is breathing very fast or very hard because they're, they can't expand their chest easily, um, then taking several breaths, breath stacking, can increase the lung volume, allow them to breathe slower and more deeply, and then uh, swallow um, more comfortably. So I think there's also a, a feeding component that could be help, helped with non-invasive ventilation. And then a, a final plug, which I, I don't know if we'll get to um, later, so I'll just mention it now. Um, tracheostomy is not a bad thing, and it's not a medical failure. It's simply another tool. So if it accomplishes what you want to breathe without things on your face or near your face, then it's worth considering. There's nothing about it that means that anybody has failed. And can be reversed as well. Turn my mic back on, there we go. As you can tell, I can talk on a trach. So that's one of the misconceptions. Um, can, you, can we talk about pectus excavatum versus chest wall deformity when it would be appropriate for to consider surgery when not this is a, a tough one um it's so typically with pectus excavatum where the the chest wall is, is caving in right um so typically we think about surgical intervention when it's impacting like cardiac function potentially or respiratory function too. Um, and it's true, like to some, it's more of uh, considered to be more of a cosmetic surgery potentially. And so that's why it's, um, you wait until you're having some potential cardiac compromise or some respiratory compromise. Um, to me, I, and in, I think in the, this population, the surgical management, I've had a couple of patients with quite, quite severe practice. And talking with surgical colleagues, they're, you know, putting a NUS bar in, which is a nickel bar that is supports the curvature of the chest wall. And it sort of sounds very barbaric, but they can slide it in, sort of flip it and, um, <laughs> and um, pushes the chest wall out. But that is something that you would, you would need to adjust over time as the chest wall grows, right? And especially in younger kids. And then the goal is that it would also be removed potentially. And with um, our congenital muscular dystrophies, I think that there's concern that it would the implosion would um, recur. Um, so I think it's really tough to manage. One thing, um, just to say, and this is me sort of talking off the top of my head too, is when you think about respiratory function, the diaphragm contracts and pushes down, right? And the air comes in. And so if you have a bit of a weaker chest wall, you're creating this vacuum in your chest essentially. And so if you have a weaker chest wall, it it wants to implode. And so one consideration is, um, and all of us, I think probably have some different practice styles, is overtaking the respiratory drive. And so that way the patient isn't using their muscle to trigger the ventilator. So in other words, the diaphragm is not necessarily contracting and creating that initial negative pressure for the chest wall to implode on. So it's sort of relieving the stress. <clears throat> And so you're just letting the ventilator do the work and using the positive pressure. And if, if one can overtake that respiratory drive safely, we've seen, if you do it early enough, we've seen chest walls change um, by doing that. And so it's sort of knowing the respiratory mechanics and how 
it all works and and doing some very fine tuning on the the ventilator and looking at downloads as well because the, the downloads from the machines can tell you average respiratory rate and especially like the percent of breaths that the patient is asking for and so it's it's great to shoot for a low percentage of breaths so for me like shooting for 20 percent of breaths or less being triggered by the patient but just letting the the ventilator do its thing to really allow for rest um that's a it's a tough question and a tough topic. Open yeah, to I told <laughs> your other opinions. Tough, tough question, tough topic. It's often part and parcel of a congenital muscle disease. We, it's a degree of pectus, and it can be more severe in some and less severe in others. Um, I personally haven't seen any of our kids undergo correction of that. Um, and there is that probably pliability or plasticity at a younger age. That's why we rely on your input to maximize and help. Oh, sorry. Is there a difference between those two things? Um, so the question was difference between pectus excavatum and chest wall deformity. Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on what what your providers think is the cause, right? So I I do have some patients with neuromuscular disease who are weak and, um, but they don't have respiratory insufficiency, right? So on sleep study, on lung function testing, on, on um, blood testing, it seems like their, resp their breathing is fine, oxygenation, CO2 um, blowing out. And so, so pectus excavatum actually can be hereditary. Like that's the way your body was made. And so then in that case, yes, you, you can consider a surgical intervention if you weigh the risk of doing surgery in a patient that has muscle disease. And, and also what is the impact, either way, what's the impact of that chest shape on that person? And if it's causing such mental uh, health distress that potentially it is worth it to make that decision. But it is, I would say in the patients that I have intervened, it's a long conversation over many months to make sure it was the right move to do for that person. Um, but we wanna really make sure the the breathing portion is well supported be we, before we talk about the chest shape itself. But it is a complex discussion. And I would challenge any physician to say that this is, a, this is how you were born versus this is how you are because of your neuromuscular condition. I think that's impossible to say. And I've had patients come to me uh, with neuromuscular disease who have pectus excavatum and they were previously told, well, that's fine. That's a normal thing that some kids have. And when I saw it, it was clear to me that this was because of respiratory muscle dysfunction that the child had a chest wall malformation. And so, so to the the assumption that or the assertion that this is just a chest wall deformity versus a, a an, an outcome of respiratory <laughs> muscle dysfunction is challenging so i would say any infant with with known or suspected neuromuscular disease with a pectus excavatum needs to see a pulmonologist immediately yeah. you know i would put if i may I would put, just to have a chance to follow this over time, I would put in uh, a plug for all of us pulmonologists that we'd like to be involved in the care of your children of these patients before they're symptomatic from a respiratory point of view. We'd like to meet them at the time of diagnosis. We might not need to see you very often early on, but by getting to know you when things are well, when things are not too severe, we can monitor to you over time and then help address what Oren just stated. This is related to your chest wall most, uh, musculature, or maybe not. So get your pulmonologist engaged as soon as possible. Yep. Okay. Um, and a surgery under anesthetic while on BiPAP, why or why not? <laughs> Is it safe to do anesthesia under not BiPAP? Positive pressure? Yep. Yeah, I think um, it depends on the surgery. <laughs> so um, there's lots of different um, reasons that a person needs to be put to sleep. Um, so sometimes uh, non-invasive positive pressure can be applied safely if it's a short procedure, if it's a, a potentially, I don't know, uh, a lumbar puncture for some other disorders or um, some skin thing. But uh, other, but 
the reason to be intubated during anesthesia is if you need a secure airway. And that's all for the safety of the patient, right? Like the, if the respiratory drive is um, diminished or term, like decreased and the, the anesthesiologist needs to control that person's breathing, the safest way is with a um, breathing tube. And it doesn't mean it's a failure, it's actually safe. And the biggest conversation is to say, okay, how are we gonna get this breathing tube, tube out? What is, the, what is that transition once the patient is awoken, has finished their um, procedure, and, do the, and how do we transition them to back to their, their non-invasive positive pressure so that that way they can be safely extubated and um, return to their state prior to that procedure? I'm not sure if that was the question. Yeah. I think in addition to that, we have to recognize that when we're, we're, we're trying to deliver air to the lungs and remove air from the lungs, but we are faced with the upper airway, the, the nose, the, the pharynx, the throat, the, and the, the upper trachea, um, such that when people are put under anesthesia, all of those um, areas become less tonic, they, be, they collapse. And so if you are already hypotonic from your neuromuscular disease, and then you receive an anesthesia to, that could collapse this upper airway, it could be actually impossible to overcome that resistance with just nasal or facial um, airway pressure. So it may be uh, actually safer, again, to, to put the breathing tube in. So it, we're trying to accomplish the same thing, but through different interfaces. And there's a real benefit to bypassing the upper airway in certain situations. Definitely, and I think if one of one of the the, the conversations was trying um, bilevel PAP or non-invasive ventilation during anesthesia, if it's lighter anesthesia, shorter procedure, if some of the thought process was it's known that the patient would be a difficult intubation, then I would really question the use of non-invasive because say something goes wrong and you know you have a difficult airway, what next? Right. And so, and with difficult airways, we can intubate over their scope. It's, it's honestly not too hard for us to do. Um, and so it's, it's pretty safe. And then extubation wise, whenever you intubate, what's the plan for extubation? And then when extubation comes, what's the plan for reintubation um, if you need to? So making sure it's super safe. Sometimes you can extubate over a scope as well if, if need be, but extubating to full support is, is paramount too. Yeah, and you know, to add, I think John's point is outstanding. I mean, one of the concerns we have about intubation is will I be able to be extubated or am I going to need to go to a tracheostomy? And that's why I think it's really important that the whole strategy before, during, and after the surgery is discussed between anesthesia, pulmonary, and critical care to optimize the post extubation period so that uh, we have a successful extubation. In my more advanced patients, I we, I think we all have very frank conversations. And for, for one young man who's having surgery, I believe, or had surgery, I believe yesterday, the discussion was, I don't think you should have surgery unless you accept that it may result in the, the failure to get the tube out and needing a tracheostomy to continue living. That's the, that's the conversation we have. Um, so uh, if someone is shying away from that conversation, I think you, you guys as the advocates for your, for your children or for yourselves should ask those questions. Um, not addressing the elephant in the room is a big problem. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, can non-invasive ventilation cause aspiration and scarring in the lungs? Rich, do you wanna cover? Um, I mean, it is, it is possible. I mean, you have, that's why you have to make sure that when you're doing non-invasive ventilation, that it's done in a safe and effective way. If a patient has so, if a patient has good bulbar function, good control of airway and airway secretions, the risk that non-invasive ventilation will lead to aspiration is not zero, but it can be pretty small. On the other hand, if there's a lot of bulbar dysfunction, a lot of uh, oral secretions, choking on saliva, things like that, then the risk of an aspiration event does go up and that the approach has to be uh, multi-systemic, multifocal. Um, can you dry the secretions out without over drying the airway secretions? Can uh, do you maybe avoid using positive airway pressure 
uh, around the time of a meal or during the meal or the more effective ways. If someone needs uh, non-invasive ventilation 24 seven, can you switch to maybe a uh, sip and puff ventilator during meals to decrease the risk of aspiration then? I think it's a multifocal approach to provide for optimal safety, uh, but it, it, it can be quite, a, it could be potentially a challenge. I don't wanna scare people away from non-invasive ventilation because um, we're aspirating saliva all the time. And so the, the connection of aspiration to scar, it needs inflammation. So it depends on the person and what you're actually aspirating. So all of us aspirate our saliva. We have an immune system in our lungs. There's a reason why we had recommended the coffices because we have our normal chest motion to clear that mucus from our lungs. And so I think that, so I think that for this individual that's asking the question, that's why continuity of care is so important to have you initiate the positive pressure, you see how it's gone. Is there any complications from it? Is a person getting aerophagia, which is swallowing air? Are they throwing up in the middle of the night because they're swallowing so much air? There was a conversation in the last, uh, last session about air in the stomach and using other um, tools to help reduce that with abdominal binders, which I had not thought of, which is great to be in this, in this meeting to think about um, of how to prevent um, a person from swallowing so much air so that way they don't throw up. And then you have a fear of aspiration causing pneumonia, which then causes scar, right? So um, I think that follow up with your pulmonologist, expressing these concerns, being um, frank with the symptoms that you're experiencing at night will help um, address these. And there's interventions that can be made if that's what's going on. Some patients really cannot tolerate non-invasive ventilation uh, because of the aerophagia or swallowing air. And uh, that um, becomes a, a very challenging situation where really um, we have to either manipulate the respiratory device, the ventilator, to, uh, to try to limit that while still maintaining good breathing, or we have to consider other options. Um, and those could be tracheostomy or negative pressure ventilation. And um, in regards to the aerophagia too, the abdominal binder is a great idea. The one, one thing would be make sure that, so as you're laying flat, if you have a, a weaker diaphragm or even without, gravity is not your friend anymore and your abdominal contents get pushed up against your diaphragm. And so if you already, if, and especially if you um, have a weaker diaphragm. And so if you end up that, you know, you have the binder on, but you don't have your mask on yet, you may become really symptomatic and not feel great. And so I think having the binder on while sleeping, you propped up or soup or lying flat. Otherwise, um, just make sure the, the support is on. Um, and the one thing too, sort of a plug for sleep studies and titrations is during a sleep study and testing different pressures, you can see that a give, there's probably going to be an ideal pressure that's identified. Um, it could be a higher pressure and that that's what generates some aerophagia. And so you may have um, tested some lower pressures that might not be perfect, but can still get the job done. And sort of like um, Oren is alluding to adjusting the pressures, the sleep study data can sort of help guide you to like a little lower pressure, the CO2 is still okay. The respiratory rate might not be ideal, but that's okay. Or the CO2 might be not quite at goal, but it's much better than what it was. Sure, we can try this pressure and go from there. I've taken that approach for some patients and it's actually worked pretty well too. Okay, so we have a couple of questions about pneumothorax and a new vocabulary word for me, catamenial pneumothorax. Um, we have someone who has um, had many lung collapses always just before or during her period. Um, and then another question about does BiPAP cause pneumothorax? So I can just talk about pneumothoraxes for a little bit. start in one element of this, which is uh, in certain subtypes of muscular dystrophy, in particular the collagen 6 ray dystrophies, there is a proclivity or a tendency towards pneumothorax. Some children are actually born with a pneumothorax, not just unilaterally, but bilaterally, and then need really significant um, effort initially in the first few weeks of life to help keep both lungs inflated. And, and throughout the life of an individual with collagen six ray dystrophy, there can be a recurrence of a pneumothorax. So it should always be on your mind that if you're having respiratory distress to make sure that you're evaluated for a pneumothorax and treated if it is found. So that's my, that's my uh, one comment there. I am not familiar with catamenial or period associated pneumothorax. Um, I've seen catamenial hemoptysis or, or um, airway bleeding from endometrial tissue in the lungs. So pulmonary endometriosis. 
uh, which is exceedingly rare, but we've seen it. Um, can BiPAP cause pneumothorax? I suppose theoretically, yes. Uh, the pressures we tend to use in uh, with BiPAP are not so, so high that I would expect the lung tissue to be able to rupture under those pressures. Um, usually, so um, when, when a person with normal respiratory muscle strength takes a deep breath and coughs, they can generate 100 or more centimeters of water pressure in the chest. What we use with BiPAP is usually you know, up to about 25 or 30 centimeters of water pressure. So I can't imagine it could cause um, a pneumothorax. Um, same, and then the same um, would apply to cough assist, frankly. Now, I, I have seen some patients uh, with neuromuscular disease with pneumothorax, and I can't tell you that their BiPAP did not cause it, uh, but there are other reasons that they could have a pneumothorax as well. So how's that for hedging? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kravitz? Uh, I really... I agree with Oren. Um, the risk, I mean, there's always the theoretical risk for any type of positive pressure ventilation leading to a pneumothorax, but on the standard pressures that we use both for, the bi for BiPAP non-invasive, even for uh, tracheostomy and invasive ventilation and cough assist, um, the probabilities of causing pneumothorax just by that alone is pretty low. Usually it's gonna be have to other multifactorial uh, issues occurring that could be potentially leading to that. And as for uh, period related uh, pneumothoraces, you know, we always read about that uh, in pediatrics. I, I have to say, I have no experience with that. I'd have to read out, reach out to my adult colleagues to get their insight and guidance. I, I wanna put a little twist on the question, which is uh, to, to ask another one, can BiPAP or cough assist perpetuate a pneumothorax? So let's say you, you've suffered the pneumothorax for whatever reason, can can positive pressure contribute? And the answer is yes, uh, because what we want is for the lung tissue that's ruptured to heal and under positive pressure, it may be forced apart and not able to heal. So we have to be very careful in patients with pneumothorax about what kind of pressures we're using. Um, if they need respiratory support to breathe, then that's what we have to do, um, but we have to be thoughtful about how to manage it, either with a chest tube draining the pneumothorax so that the, the lung can re-expand and heal that way or other methods. Yeah. Okay. All right, this is a gonna be a fight between our sleep specialists and our non-sleep specialists. Who should manage nighttime non-invasive ventilation, your local pulmonologist or your sleep study specialist? <laughs> Why can't they be the same person? Yeah. Often they are not. Ideally, that is <laughs> which so is true, weird to me. Yeah, that is true. Um, I think so. It's helpful to so for one, I guess, just to mention the path to getting to sleep medicine. So one can become a sleep physician from pulmonary, neurology, ENT, psychiatry, internal medicine, pediatrics, uh, uh, anesthesia. Family, family medicine too. Yeah, not anesthesia. Psychiatry. Psych psychiatry, yes, thank you, which they are so helpful. Um, but I, yeah, so in other words, you may be having a sleep physician who doesn't have the respiratory physiology per se in their, um, as, as familiar with it, we should say, in their repertoire. And so I think it's really helpful having a pulmonary trained sleep physician. That being said, there's still some nuances to reading a sleep study that doesn't, get um, calculated when you um, sort of push the button to make the report there, it, you don't necessarily see the average respiratory rate um, that's split between dream sleep and non-dream sleep. Um, just to mention in, in dream sleep, we lose muscle tone. And so we're largely dependent on diaphragm function. Um, and so for one who's going to be have weaker diaphragms, then you can imagine dream sleep becomes a big issue. Um, and that's where often sleep disorder breathing first shows, and then we'll spread to the non-dream, like the full night, and then go on to the, the daytime from there. But I would, I think that having um, a pulmonary background with a sleep specialist is helpful. And even so then we end up doing, I think Rich, you probably would agree, we end up doing some educating there too, just because um, 
you don't necessarily always look for the respiratory rate of the individual. Hopefully we do. But because um, what we can see is that the CO2 monitoring, the number may be sort of high normal or mildly abnormal, but the respiratory rate's really high. And so the patient's compensating, trying to keep up. And so by our criteria from sleep standpoint, um, they may not fully qualify for hypoventilation, if you will, but they're compensating for it. And so to me, um, it's the standard criteria for hypoventilation doesn't really apply to the neuromuscular uh, community. So um, that's where having even sort of the neuromuscular background is helpful. It's, it's tough. But. Yeah, I, I have to agree with what John was saying. I've gotten into many arguments with my neurology colleagues who are also fine sleep physicians. And the CO2s are clearly elevated uh, by pulmonologist standard, but they don't meet the American Academy of Sleep Medicine criteria for hypoventilation. So they read them as normal ventilation. And I have to go back in and put qualifiers on it. Um, what I would emphasize is a lot of families will ask us, well, can I get a sleep study done in my community rather than having to come to the academic center um, and in general, my request is no, unless they have expertise and experience in neuromuscular. And the one absolutely no, no go is we do not do home sleep studies on our neuromuscular patients. They are great for standard obstructive sleep apnea and otherwise medically simple patient. Neuromuscular patients should not be getting home sleep studies. So I'll put in the plug for um, the patient and family being the one in charge of their ventilation. Um, we are here at your service. Uh, and if there's a disagreement between your pulmonologist and your sleep doctor, even if they're the same person, uh, yeah. then, uh, then it, it's really up to the clinical scenario and, um, and the, the person who, who knows the patient best, which is the family. Um, and so, and that it, if you have to defer to a medical specialist, then I would say that the person who knows neuromuscular disease, regardless of their training, is the person who should be um, helping make those decisions. So we, I often read between the lines in a sleep study, and uh, I've not had much in the way of difficulty from um, from insurance providers in getting what we need. And our, our, I think our names are listed on CureCMD too. So if there's ever any questions or concerns, you can please reach out. Um, actually, after Chicago, I think I had a couple reach out. And I have a lot of questions I'm saving for later because we can't possibly, we'll be here till 10 o'clock tonight. You guys have amazing questions and I would love to answer all of it. I would like to plug KSSK CMD chats that all of these guys have been on um, to talk about pulmonary care from a very accessible space. Um, so please watch that series. You can find it on our CureCMD's website and it's great for Nemo and Titan too. It's not just CMD. All right, last question. Um, like I said, so many great questions. Um, and you're not going to be able to answer this. It's a great part. Uh, masks. I, I'm going to change the question a little bit. How do, you, how do you pick a mask? How do you decide if it's working? Should you change it at some point? Like, we just talk about masks for a minute. As in the interface for non-invasive ventilation? Yes. Okay. All right, just making sure. Sorry. <laughs> Not these. <laughs> I think what on it. So our, our preference is definitely a nasal mask if you can, um, just because with um, you, if you're unable to remove the mask at night, say one gets aerophagia, feels sick and throws up. Um, then if you have a mask that's covering your nose and your mouth and you can't remove it, it, that could be bad and have a big aspiration event. And so we always try to do a nasal mask if we can. Um, what type of mask, whatever works um, as far as that goes. And so whatever is comfortable. Uh, there's some masks that are associated with maybe a little more leak than other, others, but um, honestly, a lot of my patients have the, the wisp. So something that covers, goes around the nose. I think see a lot of head nods, right? Um, for some moving positions can generate leak as the trunk sort of pulls. And so I, there's other masks that just rest right under the nose, but don't have prongs going in and they connect on top. So one is called Dreamwear. Um, and that I've had a lot of good luck with too. But in general, masks, whatever is most comfortable and it's gonna help our um, help the, the your your kids to wear it all night, hopefully. And um, and 
uh, whatever, ideally sort of minimizing leak too, if possible, but the nasal interface is the big thing. What about open mouth sleepers? Yeah, yeah compensating for open mouth leak is, is difficult. Most of the ventilators actually can overcome a significant amount of leaks, so it isn't often as big an issue as we think. Um, we can certainly try to use chin straps to close the mouth a little bit. We don't need the mouth completely closed, so you don't have to like, duct tape the face, um, but uh, just keeping the mouth a little bit more closed to reduce the leak but not eliminate it can be helpful too. I still have safety concerns about that, yeah. um, but it, it can be done. And then in, in special circumstances, I'm willing to use a full or oral nasal face mask. So if someone has private duty nursing with someone awake and observing the child, then I'm more likely to be okay with it. Uh, I, it's, uh, so that's the technical aspect of a full face mask. The physiologic impact is actually that it's probably not as well tolerated anyway as, a, as just a nasal mask. Um, from a physics and airflow standpoint, it's actually creating two different airflows, one through the nose and one through the mouth with a pallet in the middle that can vibrate and cause turbulent airflow so that air delivery to the, to the back of the throat and the lungs is actually more turbulent and not as efficient. So it's probably not as good anyway as, a, as an interface compared to a nasal mask. And then finally, many face masks will actually push the chin in and cause more upper airway obstruction. So that, so it's another you know, two or three reasons not to use a full face mask. And then the, the last thing maybe on this topic is that um, faces grow. Um, and so refitting the mask is very important. So if you're seeing sleep quality change or nighttime awakenings or increased leak or desaturations, one of the possibilities for, that one of the causes of that could be that the mask is no longer fitting. And then um, because masks often sit in roughly the same place on the maxilla, they can actually cause facial deformities over time. So as bones are growing, especially in myopathic weak muscled faces, uh, the, the bone structure can actually be altered by non-invasive ventilation. So in an ideal world, each patient would have two masks with different pressure points on their face to mitigate those changes. I don't know very many patients who can tolerate and use two masks, much less one. And, and some who may be on it for longer than just overnight too, may have, uh, may alternate like nasal interfaces just to give some, some break for the, if there's any concern for skin breakdown and things like that, right? So off, off those pressure points. Dr. Kravitz, any last yeah, words on uh, masks? Uh, I agree with what uh, Orrin and John were just saying. You know, if you have one mask that fits and is comfortable, you're you're in great shape. But getting a second or third um, is nice if you can rotate them to avoid pressure points. I was lucky. I had one young uh, one young adult with Duchesne who um, had a mask for nighttime, a mask when he was sick, a mask when he was eating, and a mask when he was just out and about because he was on 24 seven. Uh, he had a very helpful DME company that really worked with him that he's the exception to the rule. But if you can have a backup mask or two, that's great. And I agree with Oren's concerns um, about full face masks. I've used them, but it has to be just the right patient in the right circumstance uh, to maintain safety.